Especially with the new patch coming out, a lot of players are reconsidering their weapon choices based on the new changes, so I figure this is a pretty good time to talk about the process of choosing a weapon. In every game of Splatoon, you're given one of the most important strategic choices before the game even starts, choosing which weapon you'll use in that game. That choice changes how much range you have, how much paint you can put down, and what shape that ink goes down in, how much damage you do, what sub-weapon you throw, what special you provide for yourself or the team. It has massive implications for every in-game choice you make. To start with, we're going to assume that the reason you're picking the weapon is to give you the best chance of winning in any given game on any particular balance patch. That's not the assumption that just about anyone ever starts with, and I'll address that later in the video. But for now, we are robots who seek only victory. One idea you might suggest is for people to become very skilled on every weapon in the game so that you can always just choose the weapon that best suits the situation. A player who does this, or at least has a large pool of very different weapons, refers to themselves as a flex, a chameleon who conforms to whatever comp they're put into and can be expected to play the role reasonably well, whatever they need to do. I personally don't think that playing as a flex is the best way to learn Splatoon. Top players tend to be able to flex a bit more effectively than even other competitive players can, but I still personally adhere to a different philosophy for choosing weapons. See, if you're spending 100 hours on 10 different weapons, there are certainly valuable things you'll learn about the game from experiencing so many different playstyles, but at the end of the day, you won't be able to win games as well with that knowledge. If you had played one weapon for a thousand hours, you'd get more experience on how that particular weapon needs to deal with a lot more different strategies. You'd know to avoid that one angle on that one map where you get sniped by E-Leader a lot, and that this one weapon matchup has an odd counter strategy that you've only ever had to use twice, and you'll know how every single weapon in the game is likely to respond to you popping your special right in front of them. Even if another strategy counters yours on paper, You'll have experienced that counter strategy so many times while playing that you actually might have a better chance of beating it with your main strategy than you would switching to something else that in theory would be more advantageous to you. Also, you'll have more mechanical practice on that weapon. Learning how to jump shot with buckets isn't going to help you learn how to main strafe with a splash o matic and unlearning that tactic will take some time and cause some mistakes. You also probably won't have quite as good a flowchart for which directions you should be main strafing and when to throw an opponent's aim off again, because, again, you haven't been practicing it. This philosophy of picking one weapon and sticking with it through thick and thin is called solo maining it, where your main is the main go-to primary weapon you'll choose a vast majority of the time. So this is the only weapon that you would consider your main, as opposed to a duo main player who is pretty equally skilled at two main weapons, and so on. Even if we spread this over a very long time scale, allow that the flex player in question and the solo main in question have 10,000 hours in the game, I still think the game has a high enough skill ceiling that the solo main will be able to outplay any of the flex player's options as long as the solo main's weapon isn't holding them back too much. That, however, is the catch. If a balance patch were to absolutely gut the one option that's been your go-to for a very long time, it may be hard to get back into the game playing at anywhere near the same level you did before, because regardless of how skillfully you play it, your weapon just has easily executed counter strategies you can't do much about. Even if you never miss a flick with a dynamo roller, if the enemy player squid rolls you won't splat them. You don't have the range to contest an E-Leader player, and unlike in Splatoon 2, your special can't be used to displace them. Therefore, the safest way to approach choosing a weapon, and the one settled on by the vast majority of competitive players I've encountered, is to compromise between the two approaches. Rather than solo maining a weapon and praying it stays relevant, players tend to choose a few different weapons that are similar enough to each other that most of the learning you do on one weapon carries over to other weapons in your weapon pool. I was a Tenetech Splattershot player for a very long time in Splatoon 2. But when the Kensa Splattershot became a major part of the metagame, I switched to playing it more. The mechanical skill from using the main weapon was identical, so even though I was going to play a little more passively and position differently when using my special, there was only so much that was new that I needed to learn, so it was a pretty smooth transition and I started seeing better results very quickly. In Splatoon 3, 
the splatter shot I had been maining started to be overshadowed by Splashomatic. Crab Tank makes it a bit trickier to get value out of Trizuka. But I was able to switch to other short range shooters, the Splashomatic itself or the 52 gal, which still makes similar strategic decisions and, while somewhat different mechanically, borrow enough from the same muscle memory that they don't take long to pick up. I had also experimented with the Kensa 52 gal in Splatoon 2, which sped up learning how to use Splash Wall on the Splatoon 3 52 gal. Weapons that are mechanically similar are great weapons to include in your weapon pool, but you should also consider weapons with similar playstyles. One of the first weapons I picked up in Splatoon 3 was the Vanilla Blaster, because while I hadn't played nearly as much with that weapon class in Splatoon 2, the aggressive Slayer playstyle was similar, and I thought the weapon had a lot of potential with the introduction of Intensify Action and the new kit it received, so I gave it a shot for a while. Sloshing machines, flings of rollers, rapid blasters, they all have different mechanical nuances, but their mid-range zoning weapons with low fire rates and area of effect, or AOE, hitboxes, so there's a lot that transfers. At any point in time, there are typically three to five weapons in my weapon pool, a few of which are my go-to options, and maybe a couple extras that are close variants I might choose if we want a particular special, or we need more lethal bombs, or we want me to be playing more of a paint support role than usual, or something like that. If I choose those weapons carefully to cover all my bases, I'm pretty easy to slot into a wide variety of different team compositions while never having to practice weapons that are outside my wheelhouse or spread myself too thin. I'm also relatively patch-proof. Part of this is that I play shooter weapons, which have just historically always been strong, but part of it is also that I'm picking the shooter weapons that happen to be doing well at that moment. A slosher player may have started Splatoon 3 on Sloshing Machine, but with the recent patch may consider switching to the vanilla slosher to see if that's going to be a better option for them now. It's into this context that I made recommendations about which weapons to reconsider in my video about the 2.1.0 patch. Splatling players seriously consider the Nautilus again. Since it got buffed, it may be worth considering adding to your weapon pool again. This is also part of why tier lists are useful, because it's valuable for someone with competitive goals to see which weapons are going to give them a lot of opportunities in competitive play as they improve, and which ones are going to fall off or hold them back from rising as high as they could. Obviously, there are changes to the game, and tier lists are oversimplifications, and creating a tier list is very difficult, complex analysis that nobody ever fully agrees about, but if you take in a variety of different well-informed opinions, you can usually get a pretty good idea of what will probably help you win the most games, and what you should probably avoid spending time on when your goal is to improve as much as possible in that time. You'll also get a sense of what kind of weapons tend to do well in the competitive ecosystem. For instance, there's usually a short-range shooter that's working well, and there's usually a high-painting support weapon with a good special that everyone's using for special utility, and aggressive midline weapons providing crossfire or poking over ledges usually have some pretty high-ranking representatives. Backlineless comps have come in and out of vogue, but there's usually a demand for a charger that can hit their shots, or a splatling that can be a rock for their team. And now you can try out Tri-Stringer to see if you like that as well. At the very least, you can take your knowledge of backline positioning and make yourself a more useful crab tank or farm safely for missiles as a flingsa roller. That's not to say that if you love a particular weapon class, you shouldn't try to push it. Lots of players add a lot of value to the community by pushing a particular weapon to the highest level it can reach, helping us all understand the game better by sharing how that weapon works, how to counterplay it, what comps it works well in, what limitations are holding it back, and what it would need to be considered again even when that weapon isn't in the metagame right now. If you think a weapon has potential that others aren't seeing, getting a major tournament result on that weapon is the best way to change the minds of the analysts. But usually the players with the skill and knowledge to be able to do that are very well in tune with the competitive community themselves and probably have their own opinions about tier lists that they could be making their own tweets and YouTube videos about. When we start playing the game, at a time when our basic ideas of the game's mechanics are developing rapidly, we often settle on weapons that work really well at the skill level we have, but fall off or become much more difficult to use later on. Even if our weapon choice is primarily made based on what works best for us in our effort to win games, which is an assumption that doesn't follow for a lot of players, even some who think that is the basis for their decisions, our experience won't line up with that of the competitive scene. A tier list, in order to function effectively, needs to assume that all players are at the same skill level, and so it's based on the highest achievable level of human ability, which is the most stable, easily studied, and analyzed level of skill we can choose. 
Beginner level players often have widely varying skill levels. Some players struggle to get out of C rank, while others cruise smoothly to A rank before hitting a wall, both with no prior Splatoon experience. Early on, most strategies that you're going to see are easily beatable by competitive level teams who have seen them already. Rolling people over with the roller works at beginner level, but as your opponents improve their aim, you'll find yourself getting shot from further away than your roller reaches and losing fights. Also, different players make different mistakes. Someone can be in A rank with a mechanical skill typical of an S plus player if they make poor decisions about how to play the objective. Someone can get very far into S+, with a relatively low level of mechanical skill, if they've found a playstyle that works that doesn't require much of their aim or movement. I made a series of videos for Splatoon 2 where I tried to address the most common pattern of mistakes I see at different levels of skill, so hopefully there's at least something in that video that any a rank player can learn from. But I've coached a lot of players, and everyone's struggling with different combinations of mistakes. Every session there's a different triage order for what I want players to focus on. Deciding which weapons are best would be pretty unscientific and mean a lot less if it were based on the results from a sample of players who all have different personal challenges and affectations. Different things are holding everyone back, but the solutions to those mistakes are the same no matter who you are. Not everyone has what I call walk-and-shoot syndrome, but if you have it, the solution is to be ready to disengage when you miss shots or start getting hit, move and reset your aim while moving. Not everyone grabs Rainmaker immediately and gets splatted after only scoring to 95 remaining, but if you do, the solution is to wait to pick it up until the area in front of you has been cleared of enemy players, and you have some kind of advantage that will help you clear enemy players when you run into them further forward. It's only at top level that we can look at those players and really use their competitive environment to study which weapons are viable in the long term. At that point we can finally say, okay, this is a level at which, if there were an easily exploitable counter strategy to this, someone would have probably found it by now, and everyone would have seen it and copied it. The variable of skill level has actually been controlled. All of these players are massive nerds with well-organized brains and fast fingers who play this game more than the average person would consider healthy, and their main goal in all of that is to find the strategies that work the best and become very, very adept at executing them. At that point, we can finally say that if something isn't working, it's probably not for lack of trying. It's probably not for lack of game knowledge. It's probably that the best efforts of strong players on that strategy have failed because the strategy itself is holding them back. Even when a weapon comes out of the woodwork and people suddenly realize it does work well at top level, it's usually because the weapon is being played differently than other people were trying to play it before so it's still a different strategy even if we are talking about the same weapon. Those events, exciting as they are, are also rare. People have had a lot of time to learn the game, and there are a lot of good teachers out there more knowledgeable than myself to learn it from. There isn't as much that surprises us, after having been surprised before and re-evaluating our ideas based on those surprises. So, how does that help us choose a weapon at the beginning, before we reach top level? Well, my recommendation is always to start with the weapon you like the most, because you want to find something you can try to solo main and put a lot of time into. If you're not enjoying the weapon, you're not going to invest as much time in trying to learn it, so start there. Once you've got a good handle on the more basic game mechanics, how to move and aim and how the objective modes work, and oh hey, when there's a charger laser aimed at me, maybe I shouldn't move out into the open where there's nothing blocking it, now you'll probably start to benefit from looking into how the game is played competitively, so that when you invest a significant amount of time in a weapon, you know that it's a weapon that won't fall flat for you when you get to the next letter rank, or when you start trying to find a team. You'll sometimes learn that that thing you do with it, which you think is really smart and great, is actually a known strategy that's never seen at top level, because it relies on assumptions of how your opponents will play that stop being true in later ranks. You'll learn that when an enemy charger can aim well, approaching that charger directly across open ground won't work because they'll reliably hit shots. And you'll know which weapons actually can play against chargers well, even before you yourself are actually good at playing against chargers. A lot of the time, your strategy will have to change in this process, but it won't have to change all the way, and you'll be able to latch on, if not to the weapon you've chosen, then onto a weapon that's similar enough that it won't be a difficult transition. 
I started off playing the NZAP-85 in Splatoon 2, which is a great weapon in its own right, but I was playing it very aggressively when, at a competitive level, it was a much more supportive weapon that played around ink armor. Someone suggested that if I wanted to play an aggressive short-range shooter, that I pick up the Tenetech Splattershot instead. And while it was a little bit of an adjustment, I came to find that the faster time to splat, the faster fuse time on the bomb, and the aggressive special fit my playstyle more. And it then became the weapon I mained for most of Splatoon 2's lifespan. Even then, I never totally gave up on NZAP-85. It was always in my weapon pool because I knew it so well at that point. But by using the competitive community's collective experience and having a tiny bit of flexibility, I was able to come up with weapon choices that suited me better and helped me win more games. I hope that by explaining all this, I've helped you do the same.